Chapter 20 A Lost Oligarch But in remembering the old life, I have run ahead of my story into the new life. The wholesale jail delivery did not occur until well along into 1915. Complicated as it was, it was carried through without a hitch, and as a very creditable achievement, it cheered us on in our work. From Cuba to California, out of scores of jails, military prisons, and fortresses, in a single night, we delivered 51 of our 52 congressmen, and in addition over 300 other leaders. There was not a single instance of miscarriage. Not only did they escape, but every one of them won to the refuges as planned. The one comrade congressman we did not get was Arthur Simpson, and he had already died in Cabanas after cruel tortures. The eighteen months that followed was perhaps the happiest of my life with Ernest. During that time we were never apart. Later, when we went back into the world, we were separated much. Not more impatiently do I await the flame of tomorrow's revolt than did I that night await the coming of Ernest. I had not seen him for so long, and the thought of a possible hitch or error in our plans that would keep him still in his island prison almost drove me mad. The hours passed like ages. I was all alone. Biedenbach and three young men who had been living in the refuge were out and over the mountain, heavily armed and prepared for anything. The refuges all over the land were quite empty, I imagine, of comrades that night. Just as the sky paled with the first warning of dawn, I heard the signal from above and gave the answer. In the darkness I almost embraced Biedenbach, who came down first. But the next moment I was in Ernest's arms. And in that moment, so complete had been my transformation, I discovered it was only by an effort of will that I could be the old Avis Everhard, with the old mannerisms and smiles, phrases and intonations of voice. It was by strong effort only that I was able to maintain my old identity. I could not allow myself to forget for an instant, so automatically imperative had become the new personality I had created. Once inside the little cabin I saw Ernest's face in the light. With the exception of the prison pallor, there was no change in him, at least not much. He was my same lover, husband, and hero. And yet there was a certain ascetic lengthening of the lines of his face. But he could well stand it, for it seemed to add a certain nobility of refinement to the riotous excess of life that had always marked his features. He might have been a trifle graver than of yore, but the glint of laughter still was in his eyes. He was twenty pounds lighter, but in splendid physical condition. He had kept up exercise during the whole period of confinement, and his muscles were like iron. In truth, he was in better condition than when he had entered prison. Hours passed before his head touched pillow, and I had soothed him off to sleep. But there was no sleep for me. I was too happy, and the fatigue of jail-breaking and riding horseback had not been mine. While Ernest slept, I changed my dress, arranged my hair differently, and came back to my new automatic self. Then, when Biedenbach and the other comrades awoke, with their aid I concocted a little conspiracy. All was ready, and we were in the cave room that served for kitchen and dining room when Ernest opened the door and entered. At that moment, Biedenbach addressed me as Mary, and I turned and answered him. Then I glanced at Ernest with curious interest, such as any young comrade might betray on seeing for the first time so noted a hero of the revolution. But Ernest's glance took me in, and questioned impatiently past and around the room. The next moment I was being introduced to him as Mary Holmes. To complete the deception, an extra plate was laid, and when we sat down to table, one chair was not occupied. I could have cried with joy as I noted Ernest's increasing uneasiness and impatience. Finally he could stand it no longer. "'Where's my wife?' he demanded bluntly. "'She is still asleep,' I answered. It was the crucial moment, but my voice was a strange voice, and in it he recognized nothing familiar. The meal went on. I talked a great deal, and enthusiastically, as a hero-worshipper might talk, and it was obvious that he was my hero. I rose to a climax of enthusiasm and worship, and before he could guess my intention, threw my arms around his neck and kissed him on the lips. He held me from him at arm's length and stared about in annoyance and perplexity. The four men greeted him with roars of laughter, and explanations were made. At first he was sceptical. He scrutinized me keenly and was half convinced, then shook his head and would not believe. It was not until I became the old Avis Everhard and whispered secrets in his ear that none knew but he and Avis Everhard that he accepted me as his really, truly wife. It was later in the day that he took me in his arms, manifesting great embarrassment and claiming polygamous emotions. 
"'You are my Avis,' he said, "'and you are also someone else. "'You are two women, and therefore you are my harem. "'At any rate, we are safe now. "'If the United States becomes too hot for us, "'why, I have qualified for citizenship in Turkey.' Note. At that time, polygamy was still practiced in Turkey. Life became for me very happy in the refuge. It is true, we worked hard and for long hours, but we worked together. We had each other for eighteen precious months, and we were not lonely, for there was always a coming and going of leaders and comrades, strange voices from the underworld of intrigue and revolution, bringing stranger tales of strife and war from all our battle line. And there was much fun and delight. We were not mere gloomy conspirators. We toiled hard and suffered greatly, filled the gaps in our ranks and went on, and through all the labor and the play and interplay of life and death, we found time to laugh and love. There were artists, scientists, scholars, musicians, and poets among us, and in that hole in the ground, culture was higher and finer than in the palaces of wonder cities of the oligarchs. In truth, many of our comrades toiled at making beautiful those same palaces and wonder cities. Note. This is not braggadocio on the part of Avis Everhard. The flower of the artistic and intellectual world were revolutionists. With the exception of a few of the musicians and singers, and of a few of the oligarchs, all the great creators of the period whose names have come down to us were revolutionists. Nor were we confined to the refuge itself. Often at night we rode over the mountains for exercise, and we rode on Wixen's horses. If only he knew how many revolutionists his horses have carried. We even went on picnics to isolated spots we knew, where we remained all day, going before daylight and returning after dark. Also, we used Wixen's cream and butter, and Ernest was not above shooting Wixen's quail and rabbits, and, on occasion, his young bucks. Note. Even as late as that period, cream and butter were still crudely extracted from cow's milk. The laboratory preparation of foods had not yet begun. Indeed, it was a safe refuge and I have said that it was discovered only once, and this brings me to the clearing up of the mystery of the disappearance of young Wixen. Now that he is dead, I am free to speak. There was a nook on the bottom of the great hole where the sun shone for several hours, and which was hidden from above. Here we had carried many loads of gravel from the creek bed, so that it was dry and warm, a pleasant basking place. And here, one afternoon, I was drowsing, half asleep, over a volume of Mendenhall, I was so comfortable and secure that even his flaming lyrics failed to stir me. Note. In all the extant literature and documents of that period, continual reference is made to the poems of Rudolf Mendenhall. By his comrades he was called The Flame. He was undoubtedly a great genius, yet, beyond weird and haunting fragments of his verse quoted in the writings of others, nothing of his has come down to us. He was executed by the Iron Heel in 1928 A.D. I was aroused by a clod of earth striking at my feet. Then, from above, I heard a sound of scrambling. The next moment, a young man, with a final slide down the crumbling wall, alighted at my feet. It was Philip Wixen, though I did not know him at the time. He looked at me coolly and uttered a low whistle of surprise. Well, he said, and the next moment, cap in hand, he was saying, I beg your pardon. I did not expect to find anyone here. I was not so cool. I was still a tyro so far as concerned knowing how to behave in desperate circumstances. Later on, when I was an international spy, I should have been less clumsy, I'm sure. As it was, I scrambled to my feet and cried out the danger call. Why did you do that? he asked, looking at me searchingly. It was evident that he had no suspicion of our presence when making the descent. I recognized this with relief. For what purpose do you think I did it? I countered. I was indeed clumsy in those days. I don't know he answered, shaking his head. Unless you've got friends about. Anyway, you've got some explanations to make. I don't like the look of it. You are trespassing. This is my father's land, and... But at that moment, Biedenbach, ever polite and gentle, said from behind him in a low voice, Hands up, my young sir. Young Wixen put his hands up first, then turned to confront Biedenbach, who held a thirty thirty automatic rifle on him. Wixen was imperturbable. Oh, oh he said. A nest of revolutionists, and quite a hornet's nest, it would seem. Well, you won't abide here long, I can tell you. Maybe you'll abide here long enough to reconsider that statement, Biedenbach said quietly. And in the meanwhile, I must ask you to come inside with me. Inside? The young man was genuinely astonished. Have you a catacomb here? I have heard of such things. Come and see. 
Beanbag answered with his adorable accent. "'But it is unlawful,' was the protest. "'Yes, by your law,' the terrorist replied significantly. "'But by our law, believe me, it is quite lawful. "'You must accustom yourself to the fact that you are in another world "'than the one of oppression and brutality in which you have lived.' "'There is room for argument there,' Wixon muttered. "'Then stay with us and discuss it.' "'The young fellow laughed and followed his captor into the house.' He was led into the inner cave room, and one of the young comrades left to guard him while we discussed the situation in the kitchen. Biedenbach, with tears in his eyes, held that Wixen must die, and was quite relieved when we outvoted him and his horrible proposition. On the other hand, we could not dream of allowing the young oligarch to depart. "'I'll tell you what to do,' Ernest said. "'We'll keep him and give him an education. "'I bespeak the privilege, then, of enlightening him in jurisprudence.' Biedenbach cried. And so a decision was laughingly reached. We would keep Philip Wixon a prisoner and educate him in our ethics and sociology. But in the meantime there was work to be done. All trace of the young oligarch must be obliterated. There were the marks he had left when descending the crumbling wall of the hole. This task fell to Biedenbach, and slung on a rope from above he toiled cunningly for the rest of the day till no sign remained. Back up the canyon from the lip of the hole all marks were likewise removed. Then, at twilight, came John Carlson, who demanded Wixon's shoes. The young man did not want to give up his shoes, and even offered to fight for them, till he felt the horseshoer's strength in Ernest's hands. Carlson afterward reported several blisters and much grievous loss of skin due to the smallness of the shoes, but he succeeded in doing gallant work with them. Back from the lip of the hole, where ended the young man's obliterated trail, Carlson put on the shoes and walked away to the left. He walked for miles, around knolls, over ridges and through canyons, and finally covered the trail in the running water of a creek bed. Here he removed the shoes, and, still hiding trail for a distance, at last put on his own shoes. A week later, Wixon got back his shoes. That night the hounds were out, and there was little sleep in the refuge. Next day, time and again, the baying hounds came down the canyon, plunged off to the left on the trail Carlson had made for them, and were lost to ear in the farther canyons high up the mountain. And all the time our men waited in the refuge, weapons in hand, automatic revolvers and rifles, to say nothing of half a dozen infernal machines of Biedenbach's manufacture. A more surprised party of rescuers could not be imagined had they ventured down into our hiding place. I have now given the true disappearance of Philip Wixon, one-time oligarch and later comrade in the revolution, for we converted him in the end. His mind was fresh and plastic, and by nature he was very ethical. Several months later we rode him on one of his father's horses over Sonoma Mountains to Petaluma Creek and embarked him in a small fishing launch. By easy stages we smuggled him along our underground railway to the Carmel Refuge. There he remained eight months, at the end of which time, for two reasons, he was loath to leave us. One reason was that he had fallen in love with Anna Royalston, and the other was that he had become one of us. It was not until he became convinced of the hopelessness of his love affair that he acceded to our wishes and went back to his father. Ostensibly an oligarch until his death, he was in reality one of the most valuable of our agents. Often and often has the Iron Heel been dumbfounded by the miscarriage of its plans and operations against us. If it but knew the number of its own members who are our agents, it would understand. Young Wixon never wavered in his loyalty to the cause. In truth, his very death was incurred by his devotion to duty. In the great storm of 1927, while attending a meeting of our leaders, he contracted the pneumonia of which he died. Note. The case of this young man was not unusual. Many young men of the oligarchy, impelled by sense of right conduct, or their imaginations captured by the glory of the revolution, ethically or romantically devoted their lives to it. In similar way, many sons of the Russian nobility played their parts in the earlier and protracted revolution in that country. End of chapter 20 Recording by Matt Saw Montreal MattSaw.org